Welcome once again to the teleconferencing session, friends. As you know, this session is very, very important for all of you who are appearing for your uh, practical examination because proper history taking and clinical examination is very vital for proper diagnosis. And let me remind you, unless you have good communication skills and good confidence, uh, you cannot really uh, give a better performance in the examination because in the examination, you will be given 40 minutes for long case presentation. So unless you have practiced these key points in history and clinical examination beforehand, and if you have uh, DNB clubs in your department, so that you get these uh, points imbibed in your mind, and you remember these points, so that at the time of examination, immediately you don't miss some of the important crucial points in history and clinical examination. So we'll continue with the clinical examination of a gynae and obstetric case. In the previous session, we had discussed how to take history in gynae and obstetric case. Professor Goyal had given you very important hints, so please keep all those points in your mind. Uh, today, uh, in this session, we are going to discuss uh, what are the important points in clinical examination of a obstetric case. And to discuss this, uh, we have with us our expert to my left, Professor Kiran Agarwal. Uh, she is from Lady Harding Medical College, Department of Gynae and Obstetrics. To my right, uh, Professor Uma Goyal is there, and she again will be telling you in between some of the important points from the examination point of view. To begin with, I will request Professor Agarwal to tell our students how, what are the important key points in clinical examination of an obstetric case. Please. Good morning, everybody. After an exhaustive list of history taking from Professor Goyal, now we discuss clinical examination of an obstetrical case. Obstetrical examination and history taking is unique. It is different from the other branches of medicine. We are dealing with a mother and a fetus. Caring aspect from the physician, a sensitive patient at our hand, and an aim to reach the correct diagnosis is important. A patient is young, it may be that is for the first time that the patient is coming to meet any doctor. She may have been having diseases like a cardiac murmur, a thyroid nodule, a breast lump, a hidden diabetes which seems to be on rise in our country and we may be the first block where we diagnose this problem. So an exhaustive examination of this patient is very important. Though pregnancy is physiological, but our aim is that it should remain physiological and no pathology should go undetected. A good physician sees the patient as the patient walks in. The general appearance and build of the patient is very important. And as far as the obstetric patient is concerned, the gait is very important. Suppose she has some spinal problem, she is short statured, she had polio in childhood or she had some surgical history prior on the bones because of which she is not able to walk properly. There and then the obstetrician raises an alarm that she may be having a problem in delivery, she may be a problem in anesthesia and she may be a problem for surgery. The average belt and appearance of the patient whether she is obese or thin also uh, uh, pulls us to a diagnosis. An obese patient is a problem from surgery. A thin patient, malnourished, may be anemic, may be harboring many other infections. And these days, one has to think of an HIV in a wasted patient. The hairline and the hair texture of the patient is very important. Are the hair showing that she is malnourished? Are there infections on the skin? or she is a healthy looking patient who would be a healthy mother. The height is very important. A short statured patient means a small pelvis. 
this would be a high probability of a disproportion. 4 feet 7 inches has been taken as the cutoff for the Indian values which is slightly higher off for the western people. Weight is a very important parameter as far as the obstetrician is concerned. Weight gain throughout pregnancy is variable. Total weight gain in a singleton healthy pregnancy should be around 10 to 11 kgs. A periodic weight measurement is important. A one-time weight measurement doesn't help. Preferably on the same machine, it should be taken whenever the patient comes for an antenatal examination. A gain of weight of more than 0.5 kg per week or more than 2 kg per month is abnormal. The concept of basal metabolic index is very important. It, the normal is between 20 to 26. Between 26 to 29 is high and more than 29 is obese. A patient who has a pre-pregnancy basal metabolic index of more than 29 should not be gaining a weight of more than 8 kilograms. Whereas a patient who has a normal BMI of 20 to 26 can have a weight gain up to 14 kgs. So BMI is very important. The look of the patient. The face looks edematous. Overall, the patient gives an edematous look. It rings up eclampsia, preeclampsia. Pigmentation around the cheek, forehead, and eyes appearing in the second trimester. Cloasma gravidarum. This disappears or faints after delivery. In the general examination, anemia to be looked at in the palpebral conjunctiva, the nail beds the dorsum of the tongue and the general look of the patient. The skin looks pale. Anemia is very important in our country. Almost 70% of the patients would be anemic and severely anemic patients to the tune of 2-3 to gram per cent are still not rare. They find the more important cause of maternal mortality in our country. It has to be treated at the grassroots level so detection of anemia by each and every student is very important. Jaundice signifying liver disease, isolated from pregnancy, incidental like hepatitis or cholestasis of pregnancy to be looked up at sclera or palate. As we look into the mouth, we have a look at the oral hygiene also. The gums may be spongy and bleeding on touch. The patient may have glossitis, stomatitis because of various deficiencies. She may be having a septic focus in the mouth. For times together, she's not had a dental checkup. Once she is with us, then we have to look into the oral hygiene and counsel her about this also. In the neck, we look at the veins, the jugular venous pressure, when the patient is reclined at 45 degrees, cervical lymph nodes are to be examined, and thyroid has to be looked at. There is a slight generalized hyperplasia of the thyroid in a normal pregnancy, but the patient who is normal would always be euthyroid. But as the thyroid function tests become more available to us, we become more conscious about the thyroid status, then we find that hypothyroidism and postpartum thyroiditis is not that rare. We should be very conscious in diagnosing thyroid disorders. If you look at the legs, Bilaterally, the legs should be examined. The edema should be seen on the medial malleolus and on the anterior surface of the lower one-third of the tibia. We press there for five seconds and if we find that there is a pitting edema, that means there is patients harboring edema. The causes of edema can be physiological. Now, why do we have physiological edema in pregnancy? Because of the pressure of the gravid uterus, on the returning veins, the femoral pressures become high and there is exudation of fluid in the legs. And that is why this physiological edema disappears whenever the patient takes rest. The pathological conditions can be preeclampsia, anemia and hyperproteinemia, cardiac failure and renal diseases like nephrotic syndrome. Coming to the vitals, Pulse in a normal obstetric patient may be slightly raised or normal. 
There may be extra systoles which most of the time do not carry any significance. The blood pressure should be measured in a semi recumbent position. In the later pregnancy, there should be a slight lateral tilt to prevent supine hypotension. The size of the cuff is very important. For a large upper arm circumference, a larger cuff should be used. And now a very controversial subject which is discussed again and again that when should we take, which should be the diastolic blood pressure marker. It should be the Korotkov phase 5, that is when the sound disappears because the pregnancy is a hyperdynamic circulation. During a normal pregnancy, diastolic blood pressure and mean arterial blood pressure fall by 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. This happens because of a dramatic fall in the peripheral vascular resistance. Blood pressure is an important marker of preeclampsia. Routine blood pressure checking for antenatal patients is very important. If we correlate the symptomatology, a puffy looking face with a high blood pressure and a positive urine albumin or an uncomfortable patient who is complaining of slight headache with a blood pressure of 140-100 should get an immediate attention from the doctor. The respiratory rate is normal though breathing is diaphragmatic and temperature should be measured in all the patients. <coughs> Cardiovascular system examination is very important. A pregnant patient has a lot of physiological changes in the cardiovascular system. Elevation of the diaphragm occurs due to a gravid uterus. The heart is pushed upwards and outwards with a slight rotation to the left and therefore the apex beat also shifts to the fifth intercostal space 2.5 centimeters lateral to the mid clavicular line. Because of the hyperdynamic circulation, a systolic murmur in the apical or pulmonary area may be present. At times, third house sound may be audible. It may be difficult to diagnose heart disease in pregnancy because it may be overlooked as a normal physiological change. Therefore, one has to be cautious and if at any time one feels that the patient is harboring a cardiac abnormality, a cardiac opinion should always be taken because this patient who probably may have walked up to us in the first trimester may worsen at 32 to 34 weeks when the cardiac output becomes more or we find that one day she just collapses after a normal delivery which is the time when maximally they go into failure and that may be the time when we detect heart disease for the first time if we don't auscultate them carefully in the antenatal time. As far as the respiratory examination is concerned, elevation of the diaphragm occurs. There is an increase in the transverse diameter of the chest. Breathing is diaphragmatic. The subcostal angle increases and a state of hyperventilation occurs. The patient always may be trying look, looking as if she is tachypnic though her tidal volume and all is normal. One should be very cautious in judging whether she has an abnormal respiration or she is just hyperventilating because of the difficulty in breathing because of a descended abdomen. Breast examination is mandatory. It is the most important part of the antenatal examination. The breast should be exposed. Nowadays, if we don't expose the chest, we may be missing out a scar mark of cardiac surgery. Patient forgot to give us the history, but she may have had an open heart surgery long time back. And then we open up, expose the chest, we find that mark there. So exposure is important. Examination of breasts is important. The changes of pregnancy are evident in primary gravida, but in multipara they are not clearly defined. Increase in the size of breasts occurs even in the early weeks. Vascularity increases and this vascularity is seen as increased bluish veins below the skin of the breasts. The nipples become large and they are deeply pigmented. The normally present sebaceous glands in the breast become hypertrophied and they are seen around the nipple as Montgomery tubercles. Secondary areola, that is 
an outer zone of less marked pigmented area appears in the second trimester. Secretions can be seen at 12 weeks of gestation. All these changes are very clear in a primary gravida, but because a multigravida has already had these changes in the prior pregnancies, they do not become that clearly evident. The aim of examination is also to diagnose any cracked nipples, any depressed nipples which need treatment. So care of the breast starts right from the antenatal period. The patient should be told to put some ointment and pull out the nipples, take care of the cracked nipples, wear a support and then she should be ready for delivery and lactation. Coming to the abdominal examination, it should be purposeful and gentle. In later pregnancy, if an abdominal examination is conducted purposefully, and intelligently, the lie, presentation and position of the fetus is determined. The patient should lie as flat as comfortable with slight left lateral tilt in the lateral pregnancy to prevent the supine hypotension syndrome. She should be exposed from the ziphy sternum till the pubic symphysis. The bladder should be empty and the legs should be semi-flexed and slightly abducted to relax the abdominal muscles. The inspection of the abdomen. The uterine ovoid should be glanced at whether it is longitudinal, transverse or oblique. The contour of the uterus can be seen whether there is any fundal notching whether the fundus is flattened or broad, signifying any congenital malformation, any septate uterus or any biconvate uterus. The size of the uterus should be noticed, whether it is corresponding to the expected period of gestation, is the abdomen over distended or it appears to be less for the period of gestation. Linear nigra, a brownish black pigmentation is seen from ziphy till the pubic symphysis. This is also a change of pregnancy and fades out after delivery. Stria are seen in the lower abdomen, thighs and may be seen on the breasts. They are depressed linear marks which are pinkish initially and as the capillaries, small small capillaries collapse, they become white. They are also seen in conditions where pregnancy is not there like generalized edema. Wherever there is an overstitching of the abdominal wall, stria can be seen like edema, marked obesity and they are typically seen in Cushing syndrome. Any scar on the abdomen should be noted carefully of previous surgery. Its condition should be noted. The scar gives us a lot of information. If suppose there is a vertical scar going above the umbilicus and patient gives us a history of previous cesarean section, we should be guarded whether it was classical or a lower segment cesarean section. Was the cesarean conducted in an advanced obstructed labor? An unhealthy scar, did the patient have resuturing or did she have any pus collection? Is there a drain mark by the side where a drain was put in? Any other scar of cholecystectomy, any other surgeries should be noted and recorded and the management of this patient should be planned accordingly. The condition of the skin is very important. The patient is harboring scabies or a fungal infection and we plan to do a cesarean. This would become difficult. So any infection on the skin should be noted and treated. The movement of the abdomen with respiration should be noted and at times we may be able to see a fetal movement. The hernial sites all should be examined. Special comment should be made on a previous scar where an incisional hernia should be looked into if present because if suppose the patient has resurgery then the repairs can be carried out at the same time.
as far as the palpation of abdomen is concerned the uterus is normally palpable abdominally at 12 to 14 weeks where it is felt as a softish to firm globular mass just above the pubic symphysis it lies midway between umbilicus and pubic symphysis at 16 weeks and reaches the lower level of umbilicus at 20 weeks the distance between the umbilicus and the zygy sternum is divided into three equal parts for 28 32 and 36 weeks that 36 weeks occurs at zygy sternum there is a falling back of the uterine height at 40 weeks where the same height is there as of 32 weeks this occurs because of the engagement of the head the head goes down into the pelvis and there is a slight decrease in the amount of lycor also when we palpate the head we feel that it is a firmer head the head is engaged and the flanks are full then we diagnose that it is a term pregnancy and not a 32 week old pregnancy when we start palpating an obstetric patient the first is to find out the fundal height the upper border of the fundus is found by the ulnar border of the left hand we start from the zygy sternum and gradually and slowly bring down our hand towards the lower part of the abdomen to find the uterus wherever we find the uterus it should be centralized and the dextro rotation should be corrected before we exactly gauge how what is the period of gestation the distance between the upper border of the pubic symphysis and the fundus should be measured with the tape in centimeters one should ensure that the bladder is evacuated at this time after 24 weeks this measurement that is the distance between the fundus and the pubic symphysis corresponds to the number of weeks of gestation till 36 weeks with a difference of plus minus 2 cm abdominal girth is measured at the level of the umbilicus it increases by 2.5 cm per week after 30 weeks and at term it should be around 95 to 100 cm but obviously if there is a growth retardation or when the uterus is small the girth is going to be less if the uterus is over distended like in a multiple gestation or in hydramnios then this girth is going to be more but as a part of the routine obstetrical examination this should be taken now just evaluating the reasons why the height of the uterus may be more than the period of gestation the pregnancy may be wrongly dated the patient may be wrong about dates and therefore in the history as already emphasized it is important to find out the last menstrual period any antenatal or an ultrasonic assessment done in the first trimester which would be very important in dating this pregnancy and managing it if suppose a patient has twins or multiple pregnancies polyhydramnios a macrosomic big baby which can occur in diabetes mellitus will have an over distended uterus they may be associated pelvic tumors in the early pregnancy we may be missing out a hydatidity form mole in 50% cases of hydatidity form mole the height of the uterus is more than the period of gestation this generally occurs because of the molar changes and the collected blood inside the uterus in the era of ultrasound now typically we don't see this presentation because most of the time the patient comes to you with an ultrasound or an ultrasound is done earlier with the suspicion in later pregnancy a concealed accidental hemorrhage should not be missed out where we would find that the height of the uterus is more than the period of gestation the abdomen is tender and tense and the fetal heart may not be audible at this time when do we find that the height of the uterus is less than the period of gestation again it may be wrong dates the lycor may be less the baby may be growth retarded or a fetal demise has already occurred in all these conditions the height of the uterus would be less than the period of gestation 
before we discuss the various other maneuvers to palpate the abdomen, some definitions to be made clear. What is lie? Lie is the relationship of the longitudinal axis of the fetus <coughs> to the longitudinal axis of a centralized uterine ovoid or maternal spine. The commonest lie is longitudinal. It is seen in 99.5% of the patients. Presentation is the part of the fetus which occupies the lower pole of the uterus. It is cephalic in 96.5% of the patients, podalic in 3% and shoulder and other presentations in 0.5% of the cases. The presenting part. This is a part of the presentation which overlies the internal loss. For example, in a cephalic presentation, vertex, brow or face can be the presenting parts. Attitude is the relationship of the fetal parts to each other. Normally, the fetus maintains in a normal pregnancy an attitude of universal flexion. What is engagement? When the greatest horizontal diameter in a fully flexed head, that is the biparietal diameter, crosses the pelvic brim, we call it engagement. And on pelvic examination for the same patient who has a head which has been engaged of the fetus, the lower pole of the unmolded <coughs> head, mind you unmolded, would be at or below the level of the ischial spines. To do the fundal grip, one should face the patient. This is also the Lepal's first maneuver. The whole fundal area is palpated with both hands laid flat on it to find which pole of the fetus is lying in the fundus. I repeat, both the hands laid flat on the fundal area to gently palpate whether it is a breach or a head or anything else or there is nothing at the fundus. A broad, soft, irregular mass would be suggestive of breach. A smooth, hard, globular mass would be a head. If you don't feel any pole, then a suspicion of transverse lie arises. The Leopold's second maneuver, that is the lateral grips. Again, the examiner would face the patient, hands flat on either side of the umbilicus to palpate the sides to find the position of back, limbs, and anterior shoulder. Back is smooth, curved and a resistance is felt. Where the limbs are on that side there will be a relatively empty feeling. Small knobby and irregular parts are felt. The anterior shoulder is felt as a knobby protrusion just above the head. One should also find out whether the back is anterior or towards the flank or transversely placed. The position of the anterior shoulder should be defined. This is the Leopold's fourth maneuver. We face the patient's feet. Four fingers of both the hands are placed on either side of the midline in the lower pole of the uterus. Four fingers of both the hands are placed on either side of the midline in the lower part of the uterus parallel to the inguinal ligament and we try to go below the presenting part. This is an effort to find out whether the presenting part has engaged or not. The hands are pushed towards the axis of the pelvic inlet and if the hands meet below the presenting part that means the engagement has not occurred and if the hands diverge that means the engagement has not if the hands meet the engagement has not occurred and if the hands diverge that means the engagement has occurred the polyx grip or the leopold's third maneuver in which we face the patient and with the right hand an overstretched thumb and four fingers of the right hand 
scratch the lower pole with the ulnar border of the palm on the upper border of the pubic symphysis. We try to grasp and test the mobility of the presenting part in the lower pole of the uterus. If we can grasp the head and move it from side to side, that means it has not fixed into the pelvis, it is not engaged. And if we are not able to do so, that means the part is going into the pelvis. Auscultation. Fetal heart has heard over the anterior shoulder. The normal rate is 110 to 160 beats per minute, which should be regular and good volume. The location of the fetal heart corresponds to the presentation and position of the fetus. In a cephalic presentation, it would be found below the umbilicus, whereas in a breech, it is normally around at the level of the umbilicus. May not be audible in marked obesity, polyhydramnios, and difficult to locate in occipital posterior position because at that time it would be found in the flanks. An approximate estimation of fetal weight is very important. It is more important than the mere estimation of the uterine size, whether it is big or small. Classically, it had been calculated by the Johnson's formula, that is, height of the uterus in centimeters above the pubis, minus 12, if the vertex is at ischial spines, multiplied by 155, which gives us the fetal weight in grams, or if below the ischial spines, we subtract 11. The fetal weight can be assessed clinically. An experienced obstetrician can always guess the fetal weight and it can be detected by the ultrasound also. Assessment of the Lyca volume. Clinical assessment of the Lyca volume is very important. With hydramnios, abdomen is tense. The Lyca is more, it is difficult to palpate the fetal parts. Hydramnios can be seen in diabetes mellitus. Neurological abnormalities, congenital malformations of the fetal. And it may be idiopathic. In intrauterine growth retardation, the Lyca volume is very important. If the AFI is less than 5, it becomes imminent with a non-reactive NST also to terminate the pregnancy. Less Lyca in absence of other problems already mentioned, signifies a geopardy to the fetus. Lyca can be assessed clinically or it can be assessed by ultrasound. Amniotic fluid index is very important measurement where the measurement is done on ultrasound in the four quadrants of the abdomen and then it is totaled. Before we proceed on to the pelvic examination, I would like to mention that the palpation and the feel of the fetal head is very important. Whether the fetal head is feeling firm, it appears term or it appears post-dated or it appears preterm. At times, so many ultrasonic findings of dating may not be able to help you. But the clinical assessment of lyco volume and the clinical assessment of the feel of the head helps you to decide whether it is a term or a post-dated pregnancy. Now, to assess the pelvis, pelvic assessment is done beyond the 37th week. Patient evacuates her bladder, lies in the dorsal position with the legs flexed. The examiner should take all aseptic precautions. Vulval inspection is done to note any skin changes any skin infections, any swellings like any vulval swellings or any uh, urethral swellings, any warts, any discharge. A perspiculum examination should always be performed. Any bleeding, any infective discharge, any leaking should be noted and treated accordingly. To assess the pelvis, two fingers are inserted while separating the labia with the other hand. First the cervix is felt. The position of the cervix, the firmness, the consistency, the effacement, the dilatation should be mentioned. Fetal head, 
and if the positions can be made out in antenatal period should be mentioned the station should be mentioned and the firmness again as observed through the pelvic examination should be mentioned as far as the pelvic assessment is concerned the sacral curve is felt posteriorly which is smooth and normally the sacrum is inaccessible beyond the lower three pieces the length the breadth and the curvature of the sacral curve should be noted the sacro sciatic notches they are normally two finger wide felt over the sacrospinous ligament its configuration denotes the capacity of the posterior segment of the pelvis and the side walls of the pelvis ischial spines felt on the lateral pelvic wall are difficult to palpate normally they are not prominent they may appear to be prominent in a very thin patient though the interstitial diameter would be normal so ischial spines are felt whether they are prominent or not and the interstitial diameter is mentioned which is the assessment for the mid pelvis 10 cm and beyond it would be normal the side walls the whole of the side wall should not be normally palpable in a normal pelvis they are parallel if we are able to feel the side walls or we feel that they are convergent then a disproportion should be ruled out the sacro coccygeal joint should be assessed for its mobility and presence of any hooked coccyx if any is noted pubic arch is normally rounded and should accommodate the palmar aspect of two fingers diagonal conjugate is measured as we go along the sacrum we try to reach for the sacral promontory which should not be reached in most of the normal pelvises and the mark where the hand touches the under surface of the pubic symphysis this distance from the under surface of the pubic symphysis till the tip of the middle finger is marked and to get the obstetric conjugate 1.5 to 2 cm is deducted from this measurement if the sacral promontory is not reached by the finger that means this diameter is apparently normal one should also look at the pubic angle the transverse diameter of the outlet is measured by placing the knuckles of the first interphalangeal joints or the knuckles of the clenched fist between the ischial tuberosities which should be four knuckles this is the transverse diameter of the outlet by this time we've already made a provisional diagnosis this is an obstetric patient we're talking about an antenatal patient an obstetric patient may present to us in many other conditions like she may present to us collapsed in an ectopic pregnancy she may present to us convulsing in an eclampsia where the level of consciousness the type of convulsion the pupils her blood pressure her chest and abdomen everything would become important an anemic patient the chest should be auscultated very carefully to rule out any evidence of failure the jugular venous pressure should be noted creps and rails in the chest the hepatosplenomegaly for evidence of failure and pedal edema should be noted in that patient after this provisional diagnosis is made investigations should be done on the patient routine investigations we do to find out the basic status of the patient like a hemogram a hemoglobin for the status of anemia tlc for any evidence of infections kidney functions very important in a eclampsia and a preeclampsia patient blood sugar is a routine now in the antenatal patient serology should be done and vdrl is a must hiv after getting counts, uh, the counseling done for the patient if she is ready and a urine complete which is an extension of the clinical examination only a urine for protein for sugar and a microscopic examination is a must asymptomatic bacteriuria is very common in pregnancy the urethra is short the patient is prone to infections and may lead on to chronic pyelonephritis later in her life if it is not detected at this time if there is a blood pressure which is high 
We can't diagnose whether she has a chronic hypertension or she's developing a preeclampsia by a fundus examination, which is also now an extension of the clinical examination only. The fetus should be assessed by the non-stress test. The cartographs are right there in the wards only. And if needed, an amniotic fluid volume, a placental grading to rule out the basic malformations in the fetus, the location of the placenta, an ultrasound should be performed if desired right there and then in the labor room, in the OPD or in the wards. After these basic investigations, a diagnosis final is made. We can say whether the patient would have a normal outcome or she needs to be admitted and treated accordingly. I think this is all we have to discuss about the obstetric case examination. Uh, so thank you, Professor Agarwal. I hope uh, our candidates have noted these important points. So let me remind you, these are very, very important points which uh, we are telling you today. And unless you practice these uh, during your routine presentation at the time of examination, you are likely to miss many of them. Uh, I have with me Professor uh, Goel, Uma Goel. She had been examiner for about 20 years. Madam, will you like to tell us uh, what are the important or common mistakes our students do in obstetrical examination, whether it's general physical examination or uh, abdominal examination? In general physical examination, what the common mm, mistake a student do after taking complete history, what happens that she immediately jumps over examination. She does not tell the patient that, yeah, look, I am going to examine you to make the diagnosis. So she should first tell her what she is going to do with the patient. It's not that you are just jumping on, now I have completed the history, I have completed the examination. No. You have to tell her what you are going to do and why you are going to do. So take her consent, um, take her help to do the examination. Then what they miss, they miss, student miss, while she is walking to you, they miss the gate. Dr. Agarwal has yeah, emphasized on gate, but it is very important. Yeah, please come up, Bhopal. What is your question? Uh, please uh, ask your question from the expert. You please reduce the volume Hello? of your TV. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, please ask your question. We are listening uh, to you. Uh, we want to ask how to make a diagnosis in the obstetric history, obstetric case. In the obstetric okay. case, to make a diagnosis, first of all, take a details as I've already in the morning told you, start work with complaints in chronological order. There is a history of amenorrhea. In first trimester, maybe history of wayward appetite or vomiting. Now, if there is a history of bleeding and pain in first trimester, you can think of that this is not normal pregnancy, it could be an abortion. So you have to take history in detail type of way. Now suppose she has his just missed period. She is amnoric. She has just missed period. She has got acute pain and slight bleeding. And by the time she reached hospital, she has collapsed. A diagnosis of ectopic can be made out on only on these symptoms, which you can confirm on examination that her pulse is fast, her BP is low, on examination it is tender, on pelvic examination the findings will be confirmed. Similarly, if she is at term, she is breathless and she is breathless to the extent and breathlessness and palpitation and swelling over the feet that you uh, have examined the chest, there is a murmur, a mid-diastolic murmur. You can make the diagnosis of rheumatic heart disease if uh, there is a positive history of rheumatic fever in the past. So, you have to take detailed history to make a positive provisional diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But this diagnosis is confirmed only with the supplementation of examination. Uh, maybe, Madam, she is asking you how uh, to make a sort of presentation to the examiner in terms of the final diagnosis. Will you like to add, uh, Professor Agarwal, in the examination, usually sometimes the examiner asks, what is your diagnosis? So, how she should explain okay. in two or three lines that oh. perhaps is I think it is the question is to say how the final diagnosis okay, should be ultimately yeah, presented. Okay. Yes. That's what I think they want okay. to. Okay. So the patient should be presented, the age of the patient should be mentioned, 
For example, I would say that a patient suppose has a mild PIH, the rest of everything is normal. It's just to take an example. I would say that a 24-year-old primary gravida with the period of gestation, let's say 36 weeks pregnancy with mild PIH with no other complication. That would be one. With uh, the presentation should also be mentioned, like with cephalic presentation, not in labor with no other complication. Uh, all I will add is primary 24, uh, 24 years old with 36 weeks presentation, uh, 36 weeks pregnancy, vortex presentation with pre eclectic toxemia. So I hope uh, with practice uh, the students will uh, learn to make a presentation in a better way. Uh, we'll break here for 15 minutes and uh, please don't leave. We'll come back uh, at 1 o'clock. How to the topic will be how to examine a gynae case. So I, I request all the DNB candidates to make best use of this opportunity and please uh, keep on asking us questions. The toll free number of the studio is 18001012345 and our fax number is 011-2953-6134. So thank you very much. So please join us at 1 o'clock and then we are going to discuss how to examine a gynae case. Thank, thank you very much.